Like any great romance, Amy and Dan Gray are living happily ever after. They have two beautiful children and love nothing more than spending time together Hello. on their favourite beach. It's me. Love at first sight? Yeah, maybe. It <laughs> was for me. <laughs> but this fairy tale ending has a dark beginning. It's hard to imagine today, but this strip of sand where Amy and Dan first met is the same place that staged one of our ugliest displays of racial hatred. Can you hear me? There's a whale out there. I've forgotten how it felt before the world fell out. Sunday, December 11, 2005, was a scorcher. And on Cronulla Beach in Sydney South, a hotbed of racial tension is about to explode. It's been brewing. The weekend before, local surf club volunteers had been attacked by a group of Middle Eastern beachgoers from Sydney's southwest. You know, as we look back now, we realise that, that there was a lot of tension in that particular area uh, around that time. New South Wales Police Commissioner Andrew Scipioni will never forget that Sunday. He was Deputy Commissioner back then. From early in the morning, people gather for a street barbecue. Some people say it's about reclaiming Cronulla. Reclaiming Cronulla? Yeah. I think it's more to do with um, just keeping everyone nice and friendly, taking it easy, have a nice day. It's a beach, share it. Let everyone enjoy the water that needs to. Yeah, it's Australia, that's right. Word spreads fast, and soon there's a thronging mass. You're standing on the soil that has been fought for by Australian Anzac diggers. This is our land. The place was just swimming with alcohol. Large crowds, um, a lot of emotion, and then the heat build up of the heat. When you bring all of those together, it's almost like a perfect storm. It was a powder keg. It really was, and uh, it went off in the, uh, the sort of just after lunch. Ethnic cleansing day, my new favourite day of the week. Yeah. I got a phone call off a friend of mine and said, um, come down to my place, he lived in Cronulla, he said, do you want to see the people down here? Fuck off left! Fuck off left! Fuck off left! I got told it was like Australia Day, but when I got down there, it was scary straight away. I met my brother and he was with his girlfriend at the time and Dan was with them. I hadn't met him before. Against a background of hatred, Amy and Dan first lay eyes on each other. But as their attraction grows, the riot explodes. A mob of Anglo-Australian men start attacking innocent bystanders of Middle Eastern appearance. Commissioner Scipioni arrives at the beach just in time. I saw a young girl and um, a younger boy with her running to the north and, uh, and, a, and a rather large crowd pursuing her, chasing her. Uh, Realising that she was in trouble, um, I simply turned my car around and, and drove through up and to her and put her and what turned out to be her younger brother into the car and drove them some safe distance away. And that sort of thing was happening um, right throughout the area. Was she Middle Eastern? No, she wasn't. She was, in fact, she was a Spanish girl, I think, that was here as a visitor. And, uh, and unfortunately, um, that, however, was uh, enough to trigger that crowd to, to take action against her. It's a war zone. Anyone with dark skin is a target. Amy and Dan's group is watching on from a distance. The girls were scared and 
obviously, as it turned out, for good reason. They got pretty ugly. And you're immediately concerned. It doesn't suit either, yeah. you know, or any any of our group. You know, we're not in. We're not racist sort of people. Yeah. You weren't there to join it and then no. be part of it. No. Yeah. As soon as we got that feel, we were just, you know, let's get out of here. Mm. Bring on the fucking land! Amy and Dan leave Cronulla mid-afternoon and walk four and a half kilometres to a neighbouring suburb, finding sanctuary in a local golf club. From then we knew nothing. Mm. We thought it just would have finished. You know, I was focused on other, th other things at the time, you know. Like what? <laughs> Down at the beach, the race riots had been shut down, but as night falls, a new front is opening. Across Sydney, revenge is in the air. We knew something was coming. We knew that there were large numbers gathering in, the, in, in and around the, the southwest of Sydney. Um, in parks, and we knew that the, the level of anger in community was, was so high that they would almost become vigilantes, and that's what they did. Convoys of young men of Middle Eastern background head for Cronulla. But the police have blocked off the area, so the anger spills into neighbouring suburbs, and anyone is fair game. So Dan, take me back to that night. Finished the drink, I was walking the girls home. We basically got to about here. Car pulls up over your right shoulder. Um, guy yells out. Have you been down to Cronulla today, mate? Have you been to Cronulla today? And I just said over my shoulder, I said, it's bullshit down there, don't go down there. And kept on walking, you know, just to warn them. And then as we kept on walking, and I've looked around, the doors have fl flown open. Four or five guys have jumped out and um, yelled out, get those effing Aussie dogs. Let's get those fucking Aussie dogs! And you know you're in trouble at that point. Yeah. Yeah. I've screamed at the girls to run. Get those fucking Aussie sluts! And then one of them yelled out, get those effing Aussie sluts. Oh um, boy, boy. You're, you're fearing the worst then. Yeah. After that comment, I thought, you know, give the girls a bit of space to um, get away and see what I could do in the meantime. What happened when you engaged? Oh, there was a, yeah, obviously a collision. Oh, there was a lot of yelling and screaming, and then there was, you know, punches and hits and kicks and... I went to ground, and as I, as I went to the ground, I just, I just put my arms up. And I thought, if I keep my head semi-covered, I'm, you know, I want to stay conscious. I had one on either side of my head, kicking my head from side to side like a pendulum. So I was copping a fair baby. And then it just stopped and I've, um, I stood up, just trying to get my breath back with my arms up and then that's when I felt the trickling down my back and felt something in my back. Didn't know what it was. Didn't know what it was. Thought it was either a knife or glass. It is in fact a 9.8 centimetre hunting knife blade that's broken off in Dan's back. Dangerously, the blade is within one millimetre of his left lung. Still conscious, Dan rings for his own ambulance. Amy races back to the scene. Yeah, laid it, laid it up into the ambulance and um, I heard Amy say, no, I'm, I'm going with him. I thought, well, you know, if she wants to jump in this ambulance, I'm half a chance here. <laughs> <laughs> what, in the ambulance? Well, no. <laughs> you were a tiger. <laughs> Lying in the back of the ambulance, Dan has a total of four stab wounds, but only one thing on his mind. He took his oxygen mask off. Yeah. 
Why did you do that for? I just had a question, that's all. What was the question? I said, uh, obviously given the circumstances, I didn't get the opportunity to speak to you about this, but if there's any um, chance after I get out of hospital, I might be able to take you out on a date. <laughs> Uh, your response? I said yes, but put your oxygen mask back on, you idiot. <laughs> Despite the jokes, Dan's condition could not be more serious. By the time they get to hospital, he's fighting for his life due to severe internal bleeding. And they had taken me to a counsellor's room and gave me the talk of, you know, he might not survive this. and. They gave you that talk? Yeah. They said, you need to be prepared that he may not survive. How did you react? I didn't know how to react. I was just yeah. crying and shaking. Thankfully, Dan emerges from surgery and begins a slow recovery. But he's in a real hurry to reunite with the girl who stole his heart. Up so well, it feels so Within weeks, they're on their first date. You obviously thought... She's in love with me. I took one for the team. Uh, <laughs> things are going to go all right. Look, I, I wasn't quite that cocky. <laughs> what? <laughs> I, I don't believe that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Their love grows, but there's no fairy tale ending just yet. Dan is diagnosed with post traumatic stress disorder. Adding insult to injury, only one of the group that nearly killed him serves time in jail, and that was only nine months. Who stabbed him? You were the getaway driver, you know who stabbed him. Why don't you tell everybody? Hey, move, man, move! How were you at that point? I was angry. About what? The whole thing? A bit the, yeah, a bit the whole lot. I mean, um, someone could say the most simple thing to me and I'd turn around and just, tear, you know, verbally tear their head off. Um, you know, there'd be little triggers, different things, that'd be the most benign things, and I would, yeah, I'd lose it. But with the love of Amy, Dan's physical and psychological scars have healed. Tell me what you think of her. No. Oh. Everything. She won't meant to do this. Oh no. <laughs> She's you know, phenomenal um friend, mother, partner, best friend yeah, you know, like best friend, um just she's just everything. Today, Amy and Dan are getting their happily ever after. Marriage, kids, a mortgage. Theirs is a love that has endured and, born of adversity, only grows stronger. What are you going to tell your kids? About? How you met. We, oh. we don't know yet. But, you know, we'll just tell them that how, we, how we met and... Daddy's a very lucky man, you know, and um, yeah, good things come to those who wait. <laughs> Hello, I'm Liam Bartlett. Thanks for watching. To keep up with the latest from 60 Minutes Australia, make sure you subscribe to our channel. You can also download the Nine Now app for full episodes and other exclusive 60 Minutes content.